And here we go. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer for Dataversity. We want to thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will discuss best practices in metadata management, sponsored today by data.world. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A panel, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag DA strategies. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, the chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. And to open the chat and the Q&A panels, you will find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen to enable those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides and recording of the session, as well as any additional information requested throughout. Now, let me turn it over to Mo for a brief word from our sponsor, data.world. Mo, hello and welcome. Thank you so much, Shannon, uh, and welcome to everyone uh, here. Um, and uh, my name is Mo Dodge. I am the senior sales engineer at data.world. Uh, appreciate y'all being here, and we certainly appreciate the opportunity to sponsor uh, this webinar today. Uh, so prior to introducing our uh, expert speaker today, I'd love to just provide a quick overview of data.world to kick things off. So uh, first of all, uh, if you enjoy these types of webinars and you know, enjoy learning about data, uh, each week uh, we here at data.world host uh, an honest, no BS, no non-salesy live podcast uh, on topics uh, around data management and analytics. And we stream live on places like LinkedIn and Facebook. Uh, and it is led by our uh, awesome duo, uh, Juan Cicada, Principal Scientist, and Tim Gasper, our VP of Product. Uh, and we uh, drink cocktails, talk about data, and have some fun in the process. It's called Catalog and Cocktails, and we would love for you to check it out on your favorite podcast platform. All right, so uh, just to talk a little bit about data.world, uh, you know, why we believe an agile approach is super important to metadata management and data governance. Um, so data.world is different. We are an enterprise data catalog for modern metadata management. We see a lot of challenges uh, in organizations across all industries and verticals around data literacy and enablement. And we're relentless, relentlessly focused on driving better adoption for those organizations. And we believe data cataloging and governance are key uh, to make a difference in that area. We are uh, born in the cloud and we uh, very much focus on how we can easily integrate with uh, your data environment to create uh, better uh, capabilities around data discovery, for example. And, and we do believe in a Facebook and Amazon-like like experience is really important um, to enable more effective and efficient collaboration. Um, and really our focus is around being open and flexible, uh, no black boxes and uh, making sure that we are fully interoperable with the rest of your technology stack. Now let's uh, just uh, dive into a few of the, the key metadata management trends that we are seeing today. Um, so what does that you know, really look like right, uh, in, in, the, in the near future? We believe that it's going to observe these four key tenets you see here. Uh, first and foremost, metadata uh, will drive action. Right? Metadata is gonna become more than just data about data. It's going to be uh, about prescribing actions. It needs to become an action driver, right? Um, and so uh, we believe it's gonna tell you based on the current state of your data um, that you need to start a workflow, for example, to improve data quality, or it will uh, illuminate the need for improved data privacy and so forth. So metadata will become the central driving force for prescribing uh, those next steps that your team will need to take to drive greater value for your business. Secondly, uh, your, catalog, your data catalog will become your system of record. Uh, we believe that it's uh, you know, going to be more than just about uh, relational uh, metadata, schema metadata, um, or even semi-structured, unstructured data. It will become a catalog of all of your data, right? And that involves things like eventing and reporting, right? Dashboards, logs, click streams, all of that will be in the catalog and it will become the first place anyone in business goes to start any type of project. Third, uh, your catalog will live 
uh, in your revenue stream. And what we mean by that is uh, many of the traditional uh, metadata management uh, solutions that uh, you know, we've seen um, were really not intended to do that. They were intended mostly to keep your data orderly and secure, right? Uh, in case an auditor came knocking, right? You think about uh, uh, GDPR and CCPA, things like that. Well, that's super important. Um, we do believe that, uh, you know, historically those types of tools were built to empower um, more defense oriented activities uh, and initiatives and rather than offense oriented things like democratization and monetization, right? But future data catalogs will really need to be responsible for generating revenue, uh, liberating the data hidden within your organization to improve efficiency, accuracy, and insight. And finally, um, last but not least, uh, your catalog will need to have a contextual user interface. So what we mean by that needs to be easy to use, easy to search, easy to understand, right? Um, similar to, you know, uh, Google, for example, right? Um, it's not going to be uh, they will be simple enough that everyone can use them without having to have special you know, data or technical skills, right? It will make the data that you want easy to find. The underlying engine that drives all of that will make the connections uh, uh, that help you discover those, uh, uh, the, any new information or context you didn't know existed. Um, and it's going to show that in a user interface that encourages you to drive deeper and deeper into the data uh, until it becomes a world of discovery. Um, and what's really key to that, uh, in our opinion, is that just like Google, um, it needs to be powered by a knowledge graph, right? It's kind of hidden um, behind the scenes, but that knowledge graph is really what's uh, going to be uniquely capable of mapping and linking key concepts to uncover uh, those hidden relationships um, and to speed up the search and discovery process to provide uh, unlimited insight. All right, so um, next one to talk a little bit about uh, a big movement that we're really seeing uh, in this space, uh, which is really toward accelerators and not barriers, right? And so um, one of the key concepts that we're really excited here at data.world is this notion of agile data governance. Um, we really advocate for a non-invasive approach, an iterative approach, uh, and really focus on the collaboration between different people across your organization to ensure that your implementation of, of a data governance or metadata management tool is use case driven. Um, because ultimately, what we don't want to do is to boil the ocean, right? You don't just want to uh, take a technology centric approach uh, that's been tried uh, and, and failed often in the past. We want to really uh, leverage those specific business problems that affect people across various parts of the organization uh, who are struggling to find, understand, trust the data. The North Star of your metadata management or governance uh, program really should be about how, how do we adopt solutions tailored to those specific challenges and to help those individuals and teams put data better to work, right, in order to derive uh, better insights for the organization. And so really, in order to accomplish that, um, what we uh, really uh, advocate for is this flywheel approach. Um, really take out some of that middleman, right, if you will, or complicated processes that really get in the way. Um, and we want to, you know, curate audits, uh, govern and document, and try to move through that flywheel as fast as possible and iterate your way uh, towards more value and better adoption um, of your data. Now, there are typically a lot of people who are involved in this process, right, from your program team to the actual governance team kind of working on, on this specifically uh, full time to data engineers, to data stewards. Uh, sometimes they're full time stewards. Sometimes, like many companies, they are just wearing the hat part time. Uh, you, got, you got your analysts, you got your decision makers. All of them are really important uh, to uh, this approach and to making data governance more iterative and more agile. All right, um, and uh, finally, but really importantly, uh, it is uh, this type of framework that we uh, you know, have really uh, come to understand as important, uh, which is thinking about uh, investing in your metadata management program as uh, a data front office. Um, if you really wanna empower better use of the data, um, uh, you know, try to make uh, this type of uh, project work better in your organization and really think about building that layer where folks can find the data they need and it 
uh, where Intra operates with the rest of your uh, data ops ecosystem, whether you're using like a lineage tool, a quality tool policy solution, right? So we can ensure that they work better together. Um, and ultimately the goal here is to, uh, you know, help you understand your data supply chain better and provide a better self-service experience uh, for your downstream uh, data consumers, whether they're in BI, uh, whether they're doing ML, AI, or other data consumption needs. All right, so um, that was a little bit about data.world and our philosophy uh, around the modern approach to metadata management uh, and agile data governance. And with that, I will uh, hand it back to Shannon now to get things kicked off with our speaker today. Thank you so much. Mo, thank you so much for kicking us off. And thank you to data.world for sponsoring and helping to make these webinars happen. And if you have questions for Mo or about data.world, you may submit your questions in the Q&A panel as he'll be joining us in the Q&A portion at the end of the webinar today. And now let me introduce our speaker for the monthly series, Donna Burbank. Donna is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years of experience helping organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She currently is the managing director of Global Data Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe and driving value from their data. And with that, let me give the floor to Donna to begin her presentation. Hello and welcome. Hello, Shannon. Thank you. Always a pleasure to do these webinars with Dataversity and, and welcome to everyone who joined. It's always good to see the chat and see some familiar names um, in the group. So welcome back to folks who have been regulars and there's a lot of you I really appreciate it. Um, and some of you I'm sure are new to this series and maybe even new to Dataversity. Um, so I want to let you know that this is a series of every month. We have a different topic on some area of data architecture. Um, probably the most popular question is, are these recorded? Can we get the slides? Yes, yes, and yes. Um, and so if any of the topics from earlier in the year um, are of interest to you, they are available on the Dataverse the site in, in perpetuity, I believe. Um, and we also keep them on our or link to them on our data, a global data strategy site as well. Um, if you'd like to join some of the upcoming ones, data quality is, is next month. That's always a popular one as well. I uh, would love to see you back on, on some of these other sessions. Um, <clears throat> but the topic of today is metadata. Um, near and dear to my heart, for those of you who know me, it's sort of how, how I came into data management way back in the day, um, was sort of data, metadata management. And, and what's nice to see uh, is that it's hotter than ever and it is growing. And we'll, we'll show some of the stats uh, Dataversity and, and and we do a <clears throat> survey every year and we keep seeing the growth and the continued popularity of metadata for, for a lot of the reasons we're here in the webinar to discuss. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, I'll probably resonate a lot with what some of the topics Mo mentioned is, you know, really that driver is basically coming from business needs and, and that not only the defensive aspect of industry regulation, but also the the offense of, of you know really driving from the business and a lot of that is it's coming from business users um but at the same time there's a lot of a technical change and, and the technical uh, diversity in, in the market and so how do you manage that as well that's what makes metadata a challenge and, and an opportunity so we'll, we'll talk about that uh, in the next hour or so um <clears throat> so before we we go too much into the details i do want to kind of show you know, it's not, I'm not making this up. The metadata is hotter than ever. So uh, this comes from a data diversity survey here, trends in data management. This is a sneak peek into the 2022 results. Um, I think that'll be published coming up here in, in, in September timeframe. Um, but when you look at some of the top priorities for organizations in the coming years, 2023 um, and beyond, <clears throat> metadata management is the, is the number three uh, up there with kind of the sister efforts of governance, quality, mastered it, you know, in a, in a way they're all overlapping, and we'll talk more about that as well. So not only is it in the top three, uh, but you'll see that that increased over 20% year over year since last year, um, which is great to see. <clears throat> and, and things like data catalogs um, are growing in, in, in popularity, both from the vendor side and a lot of from, you know, implementation with folks like yourself. So really not surprised to see that because, uh, you know, I've been, a, I've been a fan of metadata for years, um, but really pleased to see that <clears throat> as it just becomes a de facto standard really uh, to have in the organization now. Um, use cases, why why is this growing? Um, I think it was already touched on, you know, data governance is top, uh, no surprise, data governance is the top initiative 
anyway in the organization, things like data quality improvement. Again, there's overlap between quality and gov governance. Uh, really hard to have good quality data if you don't understand the metadata behind it. You know, data warehousing and BI, we'll talk more about that. That's almost your classic use case from the olden days, um, but it hasn't gone anywhere. You know, we're still reporting. You still need to know what the data on that report means and where it came from. Kind of, that's not, that's not going away. Master data, you know, how do you how do you even get that single view of customer if we can't define what a customer is, right? I'm really pleased to see um, that idea of efficiency and agility because I know this, and you probably know this if you've done it, um, <clears throat> that that the more you have your metadata documented and you understand the lineage um, and you understand the definition, that makes your teams more agile, more efficient. If, if everyone knows where that data came from, and and I, I don't know why that wasn't always obvious, but sometimes it seemed, you know, folks say, well, it's just going to take us longer and you know, we don't need that that darn documentation. Um, you know, maybe there's some upfront development to get there, but once you have it, uh, it certainly is. Wonder why <laughs> why you couldn't live without it, right? Uh, regulation and audit, and, and Mo talked about this as well. Of you know, I, I'm pleased if you see things like efficiency and agility topping out regulation and audit because regulation and audit are certainly a use case for metadata, but that makes it sort of seem like well, we have to do this rather than we want to do this. Um, the idea of a data science and big data analytics is a, certainly a driver for this as you know, folks are trying to do analytics on, on data science discovery on the data, you know what that data means. That's just a sort of you know, obvious to, to, to understand. Exchanging information with other orgs, I'm pleased to see that as well. We will talk about that in the, in the, in the uh, this session. Um, you know, if I'm going to share information with others or even open data, we're working in our practice with some government organizations that want to publish their data externally. How can you do that without metadata? You need to have that context, even the data when it was published, right? And you could see some of the others, but um, I found this really interesting to kind of see some of those key drivers and then hopefully you as well. So as I mentioned in the beginning, and if you've joined my webinars, you've seen this before, this is sort of our methodology. You know, we do a lot of uh, data strategy and this could be all actually it is a whole other webinar what that means um but what what is both interesting and challenging is that there's so much overlap right so we can talk about metadata management over in the lower right as being a foundation um for the rest of your strategy but you know metadata management requires and is linked to data architecture right you can't do data quality um without metadata management data governance really relies on metadata management and drives it right so this could be one big interactive circle and it could drive you crazy but we we, we always look at all of these touch points because they are so interrelated and and none of this really can work effectively without without metadata management so a big fan of metadata um the other thing about metadata is is probably the name right what the heck is metadata and, I, and maybe one of these days we'll change that because or maybe facebook has changed that everyone knows what meta means now right but um you know it, the term can turn people off it seems re really really technical and then what makes it worse is we give definitions or in the past and i will not write that down on this presentation when people say you know what is metadata oh it's data about data well that's really helpful <laughs> It just sort of makes it sound even more complicated. So I will not use that definition here. I like to just say it's, it's data in context. What's the context of this information, the, the meaning behind it? Sometimes it's easiest just to show an example of it and then everyone knows what it means. An easier way to think of it, even than data in context, I like to just say it's the who, what, where, why, when, and how of data. And again, is using some you know de definitions here. I think a lot of us kind of think, um, especially the technical folks of the what, you know, um, you know what? What is either the business definition of the data, or the business rules, or even um, <clears throat> kind of the how of how that data is formatted? Is it a CARIC twelve field? You know, et cetera, et cetera. But but also, you know, the who who created this? Who's the data steward moving forward? Uh, I loved what Mo kind of said about you know turning metadata into action. Well, it's great to have the metadata, but what are we going to do about it? Who who is going to drive this, right? Who quote owns this, and who's or maybe who is auditing it? Um, where is it stored? When we talk about things like data lineage, that's a huge part of it. But also, you know, I, I don't want to uh, dis <laughs> auditing and regulation because that's a big part of, of of this. But you know, where is the data stored geographically is a big issue um, with some organizations, especially if you're international. Um, I don't. I don't want us ever to forget the why. Um, and uh, again, kind of resonating with what Mo said, I've I've seen catalogs go 
wrong. Um, partly because the tooling is very good and you can catalog, especially with a lot of the automation, everything, right? And, and sometimes the driver is volume rather than you know, the why of, of, you know, can be very tempting to let's scan all thousand tables we have and thousand data sources and get as much information in there. Why are we doing that? Let's focus on the high value data. I really get that, you know, make, make it a usable thing. Why are we doing this is always a nice question to ask. When is a huge one. Um, I kind of had a snarky tweet a few weeks ago. I was reviewing uh, a metadata standards document and I was just sort of curious and I realized there was no date on it and, and no author. <laughs> so isn't that ironic? A metadata standards doesn't have a date. Uh, but often that's, that's of interest. This is from data that's published or a definition that's published. Is it from 10 years ago? Is it last week? A uh, big, big part of it. Uh, my, my channeling my grandmother who always, if we had a picture, put the date on the back, put the date on the back. And we were going through the attic a few weeks ago and found some pictures without, from her actually, without a date. And we wondered where it came from and who was in it, right? That's good old fashioned metadata. Uh, but also things like um, how, how long, what are the storage retention rules? What, when should this data be purged? You know, some of those business rules around data as well. So anyway, it's a good old fashioned who, what, where, why, and when. Um, but I think it is also beyond as, as, metadata expands and becomes more of a business asset it's beyond your good old-fashioned data dictionary with just you know here's the fields and, and columns and, and the definition uh, there's a lot more to it um, i'll get into that but what is metadata some of you may be joining this webinar i know there's a probably a range of skills so if this is not new to you um <laughs> bear with us um but some folks just you know what are we even talking about with this funny world called funny word called metadata um so i'd like to also differentiate between data in metadata. So let's think of a good old fashioned, this could be a spreadsheet. Everyone wants to use a spreadsheet or this could be a database with columns. Um, so the data is, you know, that Joe Smith either works for or bought from or, or something is associated with a company. Uh, computers are us either in New York or he lives in New York. You think about that. Um, and then the year, you, you know, something about 1970. That's the data, all those values of the data. The metadata are kind of if the easiest way to think about is those column headings that Joe is the first name and Smith is the last name. Um, and the company is Computers Are Us, right? So, uh, and the year purchased is the year he purchased something and not the year he was born, right? We, we, if you just had a year without contest, you wouldn't know what that meant. So probably the easiest way to think about it is, you know, the, the, the data is your rows and the metadata is kind of your column headings. A little bit more complicated than that, but kind of a, a simple way to think about it. Um, that's metadata, but, you know, we can talk about this as well. Um, you could, metadata could just be, poorly named columns. So, you know, we've all kind of looked at a, a database at some point that has really helpful names like string one, string two, text one, two, three, DT one. You know, maybe the developer, whenever he or she built it, knew what that meant. Nobody else is gonna know what that means. So kind of that intelligent naming or, or labeling of, of things. Yes, there's metadata that is technical metadata and that is the name of the, perhaps the, the column, but not so helpful, right? Um, so even within the, the well-named metadata, and this is why sometimes we do sound like crazy folks when we are um, architects or data architects or metadata managers, et cetera, you know, what do we mean by um, you know, a year or a city? <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's something as simple as a, a last name is, is that do you really need the surname or the family name? Because not every culture or language has the last name be the family name, right? So, you know, something as simple as that or city, um, is that the city where the customer lives, the city where the store is, where they purchased it, the city of the manufacturer of the product, the city, you know, a lot of, and, and probably some nodding heads of folks that have built these, you know, a well-formed business ruler definition is, is critical. And there's a lot more to even such a simple thing as, you know, what's a, any of these, what's a customer, what's a company? Again, is that the company that Joe worked for, the company that he bought this thing from, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's where Kind of that idea of the business metadata is so is so critical. Um, and on that note, this is a, a bit dated now, but we did do one of these surveys, just surveys, just on metadata. Um, and what was interesting, we kind of looked at the usage that eighty percent of the users from metadata at that point were were from the business, and that's really not a surprise to me. Um, it's, it is a way for IT and the business to collaborate. But you know that simple question: if I'm looking at a dashboard or some analytics, how was total sales calculated? I don't need to know that. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll probably hit on this again. That, that, you know, often we do get the why do we need metadata? Why do we need documentation? That's just slowing me down. Generally, and I may get some not, not fans here. <laughs> I hear that from IT. You know, the business seems to quote get 
metadata more than IT does. I mean, you haven't defined this. I still remember we were doing kind of a business case for a big, back in the day, we called the metadata repositories, right? For a big bank. And we went to finance and we were explaining all of this and how we need the lineage of the data, where it means and where it comes from. And the business sponsor sort of looked at us in horror and said, you mean you're not doing this? That's frightening. <laughs> we should have assumed you knew where the data came from and what it meant before you gave me a report about you know, the financials of my business. Now, so I, I, again, it's not time, and so yes, of course, business wants it yesterday and 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 you know easy, um, and they have to be involved in those definitions as well. But it just is such an obvious thing to do <laughs> that yeah, you, know, you uh, often don't get a you get some um, pushback from the business. Um, so you know, it is that that business meeting and contact. So you know, the business person might just say, "Show me all customers." By region, you know, could I have that yesterday? A good data architect, metadata management, data analyst, insert title here, should immediately start thinking. Well, what do you mean by customers? Is that current, you know, current customers, lapsed customers? You know, uh, you know, is it retail customers, wholesale customers? How do you find a region? Um, gosh, I have two customers right now who are still in discussions about what a region is and, and the sales regions versus geographical regions. And, you know, that's, that again, it's just a simple thing can be very complicated. Um, can a customer have a billing address in one, more than one region? Do we have to obf obfuscate personal information or PII? So many questions about just such, what seemingly such a simple question, just show me all customers by region. And, and yes, business people get metadata and the need for it, but we can also kind of common you know, have that sort of snide comment from the business person, show me all customers by region. How hard can that be? That seems so simple, right? Until you, you actually try to do that. And there is a lot of complexity um, to even such simple things. Um, so, you know, again, resonated with what Mo said of, of the, one of the great things about a lot of these new data catalogs is the user friendliness of it, because a lot of the metadata from the business side is in people's heads. And I always like to say, you know, avoid that. I just know. Um, because although people more and more do understand the need for metadata, we always seem to understand the need for other people's metadata. Right? I want someone else to have a really well-documented data source, but I'm busy. And gosh, don't you just know, you know what, a, what a part number is? How, how, why do I have to create a definition for a part number? Until Joe, who's been there, you know, since 1980, was like, oh, that used to be the component number before the acquisition. And actually, we have issues aligning component number with part number. And there's a lot more to something as simple as a part number, right? I mean, and that's where, you know, a lot of these, quote, simple things have a lot of background and enabling people either through a glossary or a data catalog or a data modeler or just these more collaborative tools. That is, is really, you know, capturing what's in people's heads um, into these tools and, and having some healthy discussion. I, I'm, I've been doing this for, for ages, and I'm still surprised at something that you would think is so simple. Why do we need to define it? Um, you know, address or, or you know anything probably has six versions of it or some history behind it, even something like customer ID or part number, which seems so straightforward. It's not. There's something back there with some history. And that's why, again, more of these tools that are more collaborative and allow folks, um, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, you know, there is a place for the, the highly governed kind of master data approach that this is the definition and it is published and thou shalt, you know, look at this. And, and then there's sometimes a collaborative approach for people to come up with definitions. But in either case, you want to have that feedback loop. One might say thou shalt call part number this. But Joe in accounting might say, well, yeah, but I actually I have a comment on that. We don't use it this way, right? You, you, even with standards, you need to have that feedback loop because it might not apply to everyone or there may be an issue, right? So collaboration is so important um, when it comes to this business definitions. Um, and of course, I have to have a joke and a cartoon. <laughs> Well, this comes from one of my earlier books um, on data modeling, but you know, and this maybe this isn't funny at all, or maybe it's not funny to you. Um, but you know, we've all been there, right? We're all ready with this application. We're, we're into acceptance testing. We're gonna, you know, roll it out. Just one new question: What's a customer? Um, and again, that I, I still remember one of my early conferences. Uh, I think it was the data diversity conference way back, um, and someone told that joke in a, in a conference of, you know, let's try to get a single definition of customer, and everyone laughed, and I. I thought myself at that point, how hard is that? A customer is a customer, right? But again, is it retail customer, lapsed customer, um, you know, loyalty program customer, you know, or even if there's a clear business definition of customer, how do you do the joins in the back end of the data? Table, 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 table. Uh, a lot of complexity there. Um, 
and I, I, I may be bold and suggest that metadata is a contributor to world peace. I think if we all had better definitions of things, it would all help our family lives, our social lives, our work relationships. And I, I kind of like a facetious example, but it, it sort of hits home of, you know, what if we actually had good metadata definitions of daily life? Just think, you know, let's go on a family vacation and let's do, do the ubiquitous, um, you know, in, in the U.S. at least is often a common, let's drive across the U.S. And, and, and go from New York to California and see everything along the way. What can go wrong with that? You know, family in the car, probably with very different concepts of what a vacation means. Right. Dad says, oh, that's great. We're going to stop at every state park along the way and learn something new. And let's spend some time in the interactive session and we can all learn a new fact. Mom says, you know, I've been working so hard. You go to your you know, museum or whatever, and I'm going to sit in the car and read a book and be by myself for 10 minutes. Do what you want. And, and Jane says, Dad, we're in a national park. Can I go out and actually hike and get some exercise? You know, I've been studying at school and I want to I don't want to stay in your stupid interactive session. You know, Bobby, he doesn't want to be there at all. He must be home with his friends. Um, Ian says, I don't know what you weird Americans think about a holiday. And I'd rather be in the pub. <laughs> and Donna says, I, I, can I just get my laptop and design meditate, right? Oh, kind of a funny example. But even something as simple as what we mean by a vacation, had we discussed that <laughs> and had in the beginning, probably would have a better kind of some less fights in the car and, and a happier time, right? So these terms that can seem so obvious to us of what a vacation is, or either is it vacation versus holiday, even just the terminology of that, you know, can cause a lot of conflict. So imagine when you have, you know, a thousand business terms with, with some, you know, clear impact of revenue, of, of risk, of, of how more important that is, right? Okay, here's another example of um, NASA, and this is a bit dated. In fact, some of you on the call probably weren't even alive then, um, but you might have heard the story of you know the, the Mars uh, Climate Orbiter, and, and NASA actually documented of losing $125 million on this thing, um, and, and clearly documented was this was a missing metadata issue. So they sent, you know, I am not a rocket scientist, so don't quote me on the details here, um, but when they're trying to calculate, you know, sending the, the orbiter up into space, they had some, um, you know, what, what do you call it, numbers to calculate that, but they just had the numbers. The metadata was in pound seconds instead of metric units, right, or newton seconds, and they, it went off track because they didn't have the right metadata. Is it 60 miles? Is it 60 kilometers? Is it 60 centimeters? Right, so not only did they lose the orbiter, but that looks really bad. Right? So the brand and reputational damage, um, and and just lost opportunities for research you could have done. Right, so all because someone probably said, "Don't you just know?" Right, how hard can that be? Of course, it's going to be in newton seconds or whichever one it was. Right, so pretty embarrassing. To give NASA some credit. Um, They've gotten way better. So as I mentioned earlier um, on the call, this idea of open data is a great source and need for metadata. In fact, most open data sets have metadata requirements when, back to my grandmother, I put the date on it. When was this data set published? What was it used for? Um, and of you who are doing data science, you know, a data set that might have been published for one set of research might not have been stored in a way that applies to all sets of research. Um, I mean, who, who has done it? If you're doing research, can I talk to this um, the person who did it? And we can have some collaboration, et cetera, et cetera. So metadata, especially for so much of the data science and open data sets and all of the collaboration done around the world really does depend on metadata. And most, uh, one of the earlier, when I showed that slide of the use cases for metadata, a lot of it is cross organization, cross university, cross medical facility, collaboration and generally there are metadata standards that we you can't share that data even amazon.com you can't post on amazon.com without good metadata about your product right so it's it's one of these things that's so ubiquitous but we don't always call it out as a, a first order activity in organizations um and you know for those doing analytics and that's only growing self-service data analytics is super popular but data is only as good as the metadata and i've, I've used this example before you might have heard me tell the story before, but what's sort of funny about this one is I, I was actually doing a webinar on self-service data analytics and how powerful the tools are and how open data is available. And I, I thought it would be kind of a funny example to just show uh, this is from, um, what do you call it? Yeah, 
road safety accidents by vehicle make and model. And I said, okay, we can pick on those Porsche drivers or you know whatever car has gotten the most accidents. But this is the data I got. It was a published data set on a UK data site. And what did we learn? We learned that F13 is huge. There's over 250,000 F13 things. And F1, I don't know. And F2 looks like that could have been a date, 2015. And um, I don't know. This actually, this data makes absolutely no sense. So great. Someone took the time to publish this data on open data. I had one of these super powerful data visualization tools with Psych to do some, some research and nothing because there was no metadata. And I'm sure somebody said, well, it's obvious that's a date, but is it? Right? And everyone at the person publishing probably knew F13 was a Mazda something or other. I don't know, but I've never been able to figure out what that means or, or didn't want to take the time to figure it out because there was no good metadata. So a little less concerned that we should all, you know, what does this, what does this data mean? This was just sort of an extreme example. Um, so it's a more real world example. Just think of financial reporting. Again, something that sounds so simple. What is a year? We really, I, and you can see the, the person rolling their eyes. My boss wants me to go define what a year is, you know, <laughs> but think about it. So this actually was an example of an international retail chain. They were trying to do some data-driven analysis on their sales across regions, made total sense. Um, that's a great thing to attain that you had the execs kind of looking at the data to make decisions. But typically in the fourth quarter, they see a spike in revenue. That's November, December. That's a holiday season for many people and people buy a lot of stuff. Um, but they had a Latin American subsidiary and they saw a dip in that quarter. And so they started to think, you know, should we do more marketing? Is this, the, you know, are we in the wrong market? Should we close some stores? And they did some research and that branch was using the fiscal year, June to June, rather than the calendar year um, for the rest of that company. So again, it was a metadata issue that caused confusion to business. And that could have that could have caused a wrong business decision on something as simple as what do we mean by a year, right? So don't want to keep beating this one to death, but um, that is such an important, you know, meaning of, of, of context. And, you know, may, maybe I've been in metadata and data architecture uh, too long, but, you know, I think it's a good thing to ask questions. Sometimes I'm not so fun at parties, you know, Donna, want to go out on a, a, a date on Friday? Well, what, what do you mean by date? What do you mean by out? Would this be an outside event? You know, <laughs> It would be like so weird that you over clarify things, but sometimes asking, uh, you know, clarifying questions is a good thing. So, but I don't want to overdo the business need, even though that is a huge driver. Um, there is the idea of this idea of technical traceability. Um, I had one one client say recently, and I, I wanted to, to slap him, but that probably wouldn't have been good. He's like, do people actually do this anymore? Like, seriously, you, you want to know the, the lineage of uh, the data on a report? And I said, I if you want to use that report, uh, but this is actually a common use case, right? So I have this idea of total sales or total sales by region. You know, what is that lineage back to? It came from the North America sales database, the Asia Pac, Amazon, Latin America. You know, this is a super simple example. Anyone who's done this knows that it gets much more complicated. And this is a great way for these tools that have automated scanners, you know, populators, whatever they call them. Each, each vendor has kind of a different word, but, you know, use technology to its advantage. There are, there, there's huge um, increases in, in, in technical skills now that, you know, the tool can do a lot of this for you. If you're mapping by hand, stop. You know, there's a lot, <laughs> a lot of tools that can help you with that now. Um, the other thing, a misconception I have heard, you know, we don't need metadata for big data analytics or a lot of this new stuff. You just drop it in the lake and, and magic happens. Don't hear that so much. <laughs> I think folks are kind of coming to a level of maturity, but even with big data analytics, you know, more bad data doesn't make it more helpful, right? And so you, you do need good metadata. So as an example, and it's kind of loosely taken from a client example. Uh, but you know, maybe we're trying to look at IoT sensor data from smart meters. If anyone has this idea in their home, you know, you can get energy sensors, you can even have it on your phone, and you can get a lot of great analytics about energy usage. You can get something like, you know, we found that, you know, 5% increase for every percentage point um, for a, a 20, anyway, you can see, see the data there, right? But so that seems pretty simple, but then even that, what do we, what, what's the source for this weather data? Was that accurate? How often were the readings taken? What was the purpose for this? You know, anyone doing scientific research, you know, knowing how that was calculated and for what purpose, you know, how, how were these readings taken? Was it a meter reading for accuracy of temperature or was it for billing? 
you know, et cetera, et cetera. Is the usage by a household, by an individual, by an address? What if it's an apartment unit and there's many apartments in that? A lot of different questions about even just how that data was calculated. Think back to that NASA example. A good public open data set has all of these things, the context around the data, and you really can't do good analytics without that. So yes, even with IoT streaming, or that was one of those top use cases earlier, you still need the metadata about what that means. So who uses metadata? Why is this important? Just about everybody, probably, but different types of metadata. So I've been talking a lot about the business people, you know, the finance person that wants to look at regional sales or the auditor that wants to know how that was calculated. But technical people need it too. If I change the field, what else is going to be affected? Um, you know, and this still happens. I was at a unnamed, really big international client um, in this day, day and age, had a had a, a database administrator. I'm like, maybe, maybe no one else is freaking out by this, but there was a product ID and changed it from 12 characters to 10 characters, brought down the website. They took two days to fix. Obviously, it was a huge, big thing. Why someone thought that was a good idea? I don't know. But if they had lo looked at metadata and done some lineage, they could see the impact analysis. Of, if I change the length of a field, it's going to impact the website. We can't sell anything anymore. Or we, it's going to affect something else. So impact analysis for developers is huge. Um, you know, source to target mappings for data warehousing. You know, this is metadata is critical for both business and, and tech. Um, data governance, you remember from the beginning, was a huge driver. It's, it's both a driver for metadata and an enabler of creating metadata because, you know, completely agree with, with Mo about, you know, that distributed nature of met metadata is in the heads of both technical people and business people, and but you don't want to do that willy-nilly. Something like the definition of total sales or region or whatever should some needs to be done by committee when it, when it's uh, shared. Some need to have a dedicated owner, and you need to have some rhyme or reason about that rather than just letting everyone at it and you know um, the the most loud person wins. Um, so really defining these roles with met, both metadata creation as well as usage um, is super important, and having those right policies procedures around it. So won't go super deep into this. You'll see some examples of the different types of metadata these folks might create or manage um, from both tech and business. This actually is a, a whole webinar, but kind of wanted to talk about that, the touch points there. Um, on that point of crowdsourcing, probably given that I, I've been, I was way back in the day, you know, kind of the metadata repository person when they were first coming out. Um, and one of the positive things I've seen is this idea of the collaboration and crowdsourcing. And, and I, I can be an old curmudgeon sometimes, and I, I will say I was probably a late adopter to that idea of, you know, if you think of the two ways of thinking about it, kind of the Wikipedia an encyclopedia approach. So encyclopedia, and this still both have their place before I go on my little rant, right? Some things, your master data, your financial reports that you report to the street, you can't just change those calculations. You can't just, you know, make up master data definitions that, that does need to be highly governed and structured, right? Also, maybe you need feedback on that if that changes, or we're doing some, you know, discovery analytics. We do want to be more agile and have teams kind of brainstorming around it. You want to use that more Wikipedia approach where it is created by many, edited by many. Um, and, you know, I, I, when Wikipedia sort of was starting, I was very skeptical. Seriously, that's going to work. You just have people kind of openly editing, but it's kind of that eventual consistency of information. Is general. I, I use Wikipedia all the time, right? And they both have their place. And, and yes, the encyclopedia may take a bit longer, but generally that's more vetted and you don't want everything also in, um, just openly edited. And, and I think there's a lot of good tools in the market. I've seen also companies buy a really good tool for the wrong use case. One of my frustrations with tools um, on the market, it, it tends to be, not all of them, but an either or, that, 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 that design approach of allowing a, a you want to be able to lock down when you need to, and then not everything can be openly edited. Uh, we had one big international bank buy one of the tools that was very much this collaborative Wikipedia. And when they said, no, we want to lock down the definitions of, you know, how we define our metrics to be reported to the street, um, the vendor said, oh, you shouldn't do that. Everyone should have a voice. Like, not everyone, no, <laughs> not everyone gets a voice for how we do our books. Like that, that is, but they wanted both. And, and so think about it before you buy the tool. Um, if you need both, make sure they can do both. And you, you know, you don't want something too open that you can't lock down 
or so encyclopedia based that nobody feels they have a voice and kind of forced on them. And, and there are tools that can have that nice approach. But give that thought in terms of how your governance is done and for which data sets, because you probably have both models in your organization. Um, just, just use that wisely. And finding that right balance, right? Because there are a lot of good tools. So just be sure that you have that right mix of certain things are highly governed, should go through, you know, the full you know, might take a little longer, but you'll know it's right, that governance, and then some should be more, you know, we're doing some discovery analytics, or maybe a, a one of the, you know, functions the team wants to do some of their own, you know, internal without having to make an enterprise wide, but some really great tools for that. So, but just kind of think of that before you start implementing. So uh, a lot of different data sources beyond the organization, um, both within and, and beyond. And that is, I talked a lot about the business stuff, but the technical will be as challenging and, and Mo mentioned that as well. It isn't all nicely um, structured in a relational database or even a semi-structured. A um, little bit of a plug, we have a metadata course on data diversity um, that I, I gave and, and we go a lot through that of what does metadata mean for social media? What does metadata mean for a photo? What does metadata mean for IoT, right? It's a very different model or, or open data sets, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of us think about databases and, and to be fair, a lot of our enterprise data is there. So it's not, not a bad thing. Or, or documents, which sort of frustrates me. You'll have the whole document management um, team in an organization creating a taxonomy for search completely separate from the database team creating a hierarchy for master data, right? And why aren't they aligned? That should be similar metadata, right? Just you know, a lot of reasons why, um, but really that metadata can be a bridge across all of these different areas. Um, another plug for the data diversity surveys we do, um, kind of to give some numbers to that in terms of one of the questions we always ask of what are the diverse sets of platforms that you use? Um, you know, relational databases aren't going anywhere. You'll, you'll see that both current and in future um, on both on-prem and, and a bit more moving to the cloud, relational databases are here to stay. Nothing wrong with that. They certainly have their place. They do a lot of great things. But you, you will see the difference between current and future is the distribution gets a bit more even. You'll see that more people are looking at things like social media posts and media files and non-relational, you know, real-time data streaming graph. There's a lot more sources out there that you need to manage metadata for. And that's where a lot of these tools on the market do allow you to kind of scan and look at look at that as well i mean when you're doing an rfp for a vendor also seeing customers run into has a great user interface you know but we need to get an database database and can you scan that in nope you know you don't want to be doing that by hand right so you know do do take a, take a list of what you you need to get in terms of your organization um you'll see you know what i find interesting of still a huge amount of good old fashioned COBOL copy books, right? And and can the can the source that you're using scan those for you? Because you probably don't have a whole lot of new college graduates knowing how to create COBOL copy books. So you know that's where something where the, the tools can definitely help you. Um, a lot of different architectural options for managing your metadata as well. Um, kind of traditionally, like like the met, like almost the data warehouse for metadata is that kind of centralized enterprise metadata repository. A good way to think of it is almost like a data warehouse for metadata, right? Generally it has some sort of data model or metadata model and a common storage. Um, think about that as well. I mean, do, do they have the, the fields that you want to capture for your med? Is it customizable? How much do they lock down? Um, and then what, what sort of um, integration do they have with other tools? Again, think of it like data. It's really, really a story. Can you kind of match and merge? So if you have you know, a field across multiple um, data sources, can they kind of rationalize that and say, yes, that's still your customer at a logical level? You know, they don't get fooled by some of these great user interfaces, right? There's a lot of kind of meat behind that, and you want to make sure that meat matches your, your use cases. Also, a good place for some of these tool specific repositories. In a way, it's almost a catalog of catalogs. Most tools now realize that data catalog is so important. So your data modeling tool might have a great, you know, think of a lot of your metadata is in your data models, especially at the business level or even your technical field and column names. Your business intelligence tool has metric definitions, et cetera, et cetera. And maybe that's enough. I mean, I, again, get back in the day, sold these big enterprise repositories and have seen companies literally spend millions of dollars on a tool that could have been replaced by a couple thousand dollar data modeling tool published to the web, right? So, so just think of your use case. You very well may need um, an enterprise approach, um, but and or 
Now it could be a combination of some of these tools now that are publishing their metadata in a different way. I don't wanna also forget this idea of metadata exchanges or metadata registries between organizations or between research or, or clinical trials and things like that. A lot of our business now is for, I'm just finding it interesting, is, is less on your typical you know, retail company trying to sell more widgets and, and getting your internal data, but like cross, cross research platforms for you know, clinical data or university research. And, and a huge part of that is these metadata standards so that you can kind of share data across work. So give that some thought as well. Um, data lineage is a really great use case for a lot of these tools. We're really literally that, that good old fashioned, but still very much needed. I have a sales report. I want to know the definition of that metric from my BI tool back to the warehouse to staging and physical data. So many pieces of that. And you're probably using all of these tools and more along the way from ETL to or ELT or you know, your source systems. And that's where a lot of these automated tools can, can do a lot of work uh, out of the box to do some of that mapping for you. Um, I mentioned the impact analysis of, you know, I changed the name of a field. Once you have that story, it isn't just about audit, right? And, and that came up in, in most conversations as well. Yet, yes, you have this lineage helps when the auditor comes around, but you can be using that yourself. I'm going to make a change to development. What's the impact? What else do I have to change in my life? Um, just that semantic mapping kind of a nerdy word but you know that from your conceptual logical physical data models or even just your business term i have this term customer where is that across teradata oracle db2 xml whatever all have fairly you know technical names for that how, how do you link that up graph uh came up um in, in most conversations as well either either graph for displaying metadata or graph itself are metadata relationships so um Finding that pattern between the data as terms of a you know kind of a full uh, full source um, pattern is, is super important and, and graph can be really helpful as kind of an underlying technology for that. Um, this is one of the big um, improvements over the years for the, these metadata repositories or catalogs or data dictionaries is uh, kind of a funny cartoon there. But you know in the day. Um, in, you had to do a lot of this manually, either create rules that, you know, this field mapped to this field, but so much of this machine learning and pattern recognition can scan through a lot of these databases and say, it looks like a social security number to me, let's do some mapping. So again, be careful. Um, I've seen the, the, the both and condition can sometimes be hard, um, but I, I've seen the vendors going the wrong way. Of, we can just automate all of that mapping for you. Well, sometimes you do have a very specific business rule that is cannot be implied. And you do want to say that this looks like a social security number, but for us, that's our part number. Could we overwrite and create our own pattern? So you, you want to have that mix of sometimes you want an explicit rule and sometimes you want to do that kind of fuzzy pattern matching. Um, but again, automate a lot of this as much as you can. Um, kind of touched on all of this, I, I do want to leave some time for questions, but um, metadata management should be treated like data management, right? So almost all the things you do for data management, apply, put the meta in front of it, right? So do you have a metadata management strategy? Are you aligning with business goals? As I mentioned earlier, don't just try to scan everything in and get as much metadata as possible. Could be helpful, but focus on, on the why. Who's using it? How do we prioritize? How do we organize it and build over time? What metadata are we capturing? What's coming from human beings' heads? And do we have the right stewardship around it? And what's coming from which data sources? And does our tooling support that? How do we publish that out to the larger world? And then do we have that metadata management and data governance and a whole life? There's a life cycle of metadata as well as, as there's a data life cycle. So think of all of that from soup to nuts um, when you think of a metadata implementation. It's a, it's a first order uh, thing to do. So in summary, we talked about metadata being the who, what, why, where, why, and when of both business and technical. You need the data governance to orchestrate it, and technology is more complicated. So really find that right tool, tooling to really support a wider part of your strategy. Before I open it up for questions, just a bit of a plug. Uh, next month is on data quality. I have my special guest uh, and coworker, Nigel Turner. He's always a popular speaker with us. Um, one more plug, we do this for a living if you need help, and a double plug of we are hiring. So if, if any time in this conversation you're nodding your head going, yeah, these are my people, <laughs> um, check us out. There's a LinkedIn job opening, and we are looking for more metadata and data management nerds like myself.
So um, with that, I want to open it up to Shannon. And are there any questions? Lots of great questions coming in, Donna. Thank you so much for another great presentation. And just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email for this webinar by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording along with anything else requested. Diving in here, um, a question uh, came in the beginning here for you, Mo. Um, in your architecture solution for data.world, does metadata management harvest metadata from repository-based designing architecture tools, um, CM database, and also from data modeling tools? It would be great to conform data to data domains and business capabilities contained in CMDB and architecture tools. Yeah, the short answer is yes. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of tools out there, but uh, certainly we currently have support for modeling tools like ER Studio, Irwin, et cetera. So uh, we don't have a ton of time to go through all the tools that we support. So feel free to reach out and we'll we'll give you some specific answers. I love it. Thank you. So um, diving in here further. So does um, metadata management include the extended use of, of user-defined data types, domains as a base data type for standardization? This seems to be an overlooked tool. I'm um, not sure I totally followed that, but I mean, uh, I'll answer it anyway. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so, so yeah, you should be able to both get that meta question track any user defined data types as something that scans data so you can see what those been created. But I also think for the metadata tool you took, you should be able to create your own user defined fields and your own customized metadata. Um, so it should be at both levels. It should be able to track and monitor uh, user defined data types you've created in your source systems. And then you should also be able to create those to your metadata solution. And Mo, feel free to jump on in here on any of these questions. Yep, no, I, I completely agree. Yep. <laughs> Love it. Um, so uh, how do you deploy context setting information to different subscribers? For example, subscribers to the core system analyst, open data citizen uh, analysts, and developers who need technical metadata. Oh, great question. So, you know, on the, on the slide that I mentioned, um, I, I guess partly this one, and that is why before you implement the metadata, think of it as your data, right? Who's the who's the users of it? Do we have the right security privileges and really design both the the uh, the source system of how we're importing it and then how you distribute it. So there should be security, not only security of who can't see metadata, but you know, customization. So that what, what you wish to see, what needs to be published externally um, sh should be a core part of both your design and you wanna make sure your your tool can do that as well. The one you choose should be able to filter accordingly. But Mo, any, any thoughts you have on that? Uh, nope, I agree with everything you say. I think it's, uh, again, ultimately really important to uh, think about that that use case and what value we're trying to add. But uh, but yeah, absolutely, there's, there's a lot of different options there. Oh. So, uh, you know, to your calendar example, Donna, isn't there only one year for a calendar year basis where December to December spans two years? Um, yeah, the point of that example is maybe in your organization, but even getting that clarity that you're using the example we gave is that we were using calendar year and not fiscal year, because often a fiscal year doesn't go December to January to December. Um, and so again, with metadata, I'm not saying one is right or wrong. You need to know what that person, how they're defining it. In this case, you had two different groups using a different calendar and that wasn't called out. We just, everyone assumed calendar meant annual count, you know, physical, what do you call it? <laughs> Regular calendar, not the school calendar, which aren't always the same. This is very true. Uh, so does data strategy offer a solution which includes everything like data catalog, data lineage, metadata management, data governance, et cetera? A data strategy should look at all of that. And that, that's why, you know, that, that picture I showed earlier that kind of look, looks holistically. I'll see if I can do it quickly. Um, but the, and that's what makes a data strategy so inclusive. You really need to think not only at your data level and security, but do think of metadata and then how the governance can manage that. So the metadata is a cool, the key part of a full data strategy, but there's a lot of other pieces as well. Yeah, and I will just double down what Donna mentioned earlier, her presentation, right? Not every, you know, I work for a data catalog company, obviously, but not every <laughs> catalog solution or management solution is right for you, right? So really think about what your goals are and, and pick accordingly. Yeah. Definitely makes sense. Okay, well, um, okay, well, I, I'm afraid that is, that is <laughs> why I was going to see if I could slip in one more, <laughs> but um, we are right at the top of the hour. Um, 
so Donna and Mo, thank you both so much. Mo, thanks for joining us as always. And thanks to data.world for sponsoring today's webinar and helping to make these webinars happen. Always appreciated. And thanks to our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. I love the questions and everything coming in. Again, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides and the recording. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye.